A good morning and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is uh, Stan Voiger. I'm an economist here at AEI, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, our webinar on the EU's road to recovery, um, a conversation with Portuguese Minister of State for the Economy and the Digital Transition, uh, Pedro Siza Vieira. Um, today, what we will talk about is the, the recovery from the um, uh, COVID-19 recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. To introduce our, our conversation, we're joined by the Portuguese ambassador to the United States, uh, Domingos Fezes Vital. And he will speak uh, a few words before we go to our uh, conversation with the minister. Ambassador, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Stan, for your introduction and a warm welcome to all of you watching along. First and foremost, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the American Enterprise Institute and particularly to you, Stan, and your team for the uh, excellent work you've done in joint organization of this webinar. We are delighted to have found at uh, AEI uh, such capable and keen partners to discuss the hot topic of the moment on both sides of the Atlantic, the social and economic recovery from the pandemic. In what is now the fifth of our monthly series of outspoken webinars, on the occasion of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union. Time to deliver for a fair, green and digital recovery. That is the motto of our presidency. We seek a European recovery leveraged by the climate and digital transitions, which simultaneously ensures that no one is left behind. Only a stronger, fairer and more inclusive Europe will respond effectively to the many social consequences of the pandemic while giving citizens the confidence needed to harness the historical opportunities presented by the ongoing green and digital transformations. We are going to be remembered for our actions in times of crisis and our citizens expect nothing less than important deliverables. Indeed, we see similar goals and concerns reflected in the dialogue about the future on both sides of the Atlantic. In fact, seeking to give a new political impetus to the transatlantic relationship is one of the Portuguese presidency's top priorities. As an Atlantic nation ourselves, Portugal remains fully committed to strengthening the dialogue on all domains between the European Union and the US. As partners, allies and interdependent economies, further common ground is key to address the many challenges we currently face. Most urgent among them are fighting the pandemic and managing the recovery. Acting together, we are stronger. Open and driving democratic societies like the EU and the US, which depend on the free movement of people and goods for their vigor, know that these health crises will only be truly solved at home when it is halted globally. However, as further jabs are administered on both sides of the Atlantic and the infection rates begin to recede, we are finally seeing the glimmer of the light at the end of the tunnel. Our economies are starting to show promising signs of recovery. But what will happen here will strongly impact what will happen in Europe and vice versa. It is then time to start discussing our future. I couldn't think of anyone better to headline our conversation today than the Portuguese Minister of State for the Economy and the Digital Transition. Minister Pedro Cisa Vieira is the right person to discuss the enactment and coordination of our emergency rescue packages in response to the pandemic, including at EU level, especially the measures supporting our enterprises. The minister is also a key governmental figure behind the designing of our national recovery and resilience plan, the blueprint of our path to a full recovery going forward. Thank you once again very much for being with us, Minister. At the end of the webinar, please stay tuned for an outstanding concert with Ricardo Toscano Trio Jazz that will be broadcasted by the embassy. Back to you, my dear staff. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and indeed, uh, the concert, of course, will not take place inside this uh, particular uh, uh, YouTube video. So make sure to go to the uh, embassy's website or follow the link in the announcement email to, to enjoy the concert. Uh, with that, thank you again, 
uh, ambassador. Uh, the uh, rest of this webinar will really consist of a conversation with uh, uh, the Minister of State for the Economy and Digital Transition, uh, Pedro Cisa Vieira. Uh, the conversation will consist of, of multiple parts. We have a lot of ground to cover here. We will uh, at first uh, uh, discuss the uh, EU presidency, which the, to, to the president, uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union, which Portugal has held uh, for the past half year. Um, we will go through initiatives on that, that front and the broader European response to the pandemic and plans made for the recovery. We will then turn to a conversation more specifically about Portugal, how things have gone over the past year, uh, and economic policies implemented in response to the economic crisis triggered by the pandemic. Uh, now, without uh, much further ado, let me introduce the minister. Uh, he is, as I said, currently Minister of State for the Economy and Digital Transition. He joined the Portuguese government in 2017 after uh, an accomplished career as both a law professor and a lawyer, including as managing partner of Link Letters. Lisbon office between 2006 and 2016. Uh, with that, uh, welcome, Minister. Thank you again for participating in this webinar. And let me start really with a, a fairly broad question uh, for you about, the, about Portugal's EU presidency. Can you uh, talk to us a bit about what the presidency has been like? What were the uh, presidency's main initiatives? And, and of course, you know, how was all of this uh, under the uh, threat, the ongoing threat of the pandemic, how did that interfere with maybe plans you had uh, you had made before? Um, can you sketch that broad picture for us? And, and thank you again. Well, thank you, Stan, and thank you, Ambassador, for for your introduction, which uh, set up very much the scene uh, of what I had to say in this first presentation. Uh, let me just uh, go a little bit about the details of European Union organization and politics. The European Union is uh, a, a bodies uh, comprise a parliament, the equivalent of the US Congress, a commission, which is the executive body of the European Union, and the council. The council takes the most significant political decisions, and the council presidency is held uh, at uh, uh, six months stints by various member states. And we currently organize this in a manner that uh, three presidencies, so an 18 month period, agree between themselves the priorities and the agenda for the full take. So currently, uh, Portugal is holding the presidency and as Minister for the Economy and Digital Transition, I sit at uh, the chair of the bodies of ministers taking decisions in respect of all matters economic or dealing with the uh, digital transition. So that's a little bit what uh, I, would, um, I wanted to explain before going into the detail of what we're standing. And let me tell you, we're now close to the finish of the, our presidency. We are a um, little more than a month before we end the presidency. And it looks much better now than it did six months ago when we started. Uh, the mood was darker then. And uh, just uh, yesterday, we had the Eurogroup uh, meeting here, which is the where the, uh, the, 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 the ministers of finance sit and the, the, the head of the ECB sit uh, yesterday in Lisbon, or today in Lisbon, and what they have just recognized is that recovery is well underway, and although uh, the decision is still to, to not to withdraw support to families and companies, uh, we now see very clearly that we have a path to recovery, and that's very well supported by the fact that vaccination plans are now finally uh, on a cruise uh, uh, procedure. We had certainly some some hiccups in in uh, starting this but we're now uh, well advanced and whilst the us or the uk may be ahead it's a matter of weeks before we catch up and uh, in the ultimate uh, uh, topic we will be uh, benefiting from this let me also tell you that we certainly uh, had to adjust the agenda for the presidency uh, when we started to prepare 18 months ago, our priorities were very different, but still we focused on a number of things. And what I wanted to tell you, the uh, ambassador talked about the motto of the presidency being time to deliver. Why is that? 
because what we uh, what we um, what we uh, had discussed uh, in the uh, immediate impact of the pandemic was how, how would the European Union react to the circumstances? Last time we had a major financial crisis, the European Union didn't behave very well. It responded uh, late, it responded insufficiently, and it created a lot of divergence between member states and different economies. A lot of pain was inflicted to in, uh, into our citizens, and particularly on uh, countries which were more indebted, uh, this created a very uh, significant political turmoil. So uh, also, when uh, the things started to create, we had seen that the immediate reaction from some national governments was to uh, prevent exports of uh, medical supplies, to try to run against uh, 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 ensuring that they procure the, across the world the uh, equipments and drugs that they needed. And uh, so uh, the concerns that we had on the beginning of the German presidency uh, on the second uh, uh, half of last year was that the European Union would prove again uh, not up to speed in responding to a crisis. And I must say that uh, what, uh, what we had actually was a very strong and coordinated response. And I think that uh, in the future, when we look back into these days, this, this is going to be seen as a moment when the European Union realized that uh, we have to act in a more integrated and coordinated way if we want to tackle the major challenges that the world currently is facing. Uh, climate change, migrations, uh, the new, uh, uh, the impact of a very extended global supply chains, uh, which may be disrupted by any reason, uh, the investment in digital transformation of our economies and societies, all these need a very strong support. No European country by itself is uh, has the significant scale to tackle these challenges uh, alone. So I think that when we look back, we will see that in uh, just a few weeks after uh, the pandemic hit, uh, what we had the resolve that within the European Union was the ECB uh, immediately expedited the, uh, the purchase program of bonds, uh, therefore thereby easing the cost of that for countries. Uh, uh, the allowance was made for governments to uh, actually provide stimulus on their national budgets, irrespective of the constraints that typically we have within the European Union and the, the, the monetary union. And finally, uh, governments could uh, uh, agree on the issuing of uh, EU debt uh, which was something which was just minor in the past on a very significant scale. Uh, we're talking about 750 billion euro uh, being uh, raised in the markets to uh, deploy uh, in uh, the recovery. Also, I would like to stress that this program, this, which is being financed by this issue of common debt, what we call next generation EU, and particularly the uh, resilience and recovery facility, which is uh, uh, delivering grants and loans to countries uh, for them to uh, react to the crisis, uh, have also uh, been devised in a manner which I believe is uh, intelligent. Because whilst this will be a coordinated stimulus going forward, in the next few years, we will see countries across uh, the European Union increasing significantly uh, public and private investment. Uh, and that alone will have a very uh, significant stimulus impact. The fact is that uh, we targeted those investments in things that will be critical to our future prosperity, competitiveness of our economies and the adaptations to the challenges of climate change. 
So I think that uh, uh, we had those agreements and for the Portuguese presidency is to, just to make sure that we could implement and execute on that, on those. And so I would, uh, I would uh, just uh, highlight the fact that we have agreed uh, and managed to navigate the very political nitty gritty of getting to the details of passing the regulations and legislation required to do this. We achieve a very significant agreement uh, for the easing of budgetary policy for the next two years, which will allow member states to continue to support uh, the economies uh, uh, even as we are recovering, uh, thereby opening the, the ground for a review of the budgetary uh, rules which are prevailing here. Uh, but at the same time, we have held uh, other significant topics such as making a, a, a very high level meeting between the European Union and India, therefore uh, embracing and uh, in trying to increase and exp uh, improve uh, relations with one of the major democracies in the world, but also the uh, social summit, which is aimed to ensure that as we progress to changes which will impact on our companies and jobs, everyone has the ability to get the training and the, the protection uh, so that we have a, an inclusive transition. And finally, uh, I would uh, also highlight the fact that we have reached an agreement on a climate law, which will be important to provide clarity for all stakeholders to know where they stand in the next decade so that they can gear their investments to where it's required to adjust. I, I do believe that the next decade will be uh, an era of uh, significant growth and particularly growth in, 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 in productivity. Uh, we are going to see a coordinated effort within the Europe and the US on uh, investing in getting our infrastructure fit for purpose, getting uh, our workforces and our companies uh, uh, with capacity to deal with the technological change that will uh, be able to will need to happen, and we will also uh, be able to uh, finally bring about the full benefits of the maturity of digital technologies that we have been developing in the next decade. So I'm, I think we are all looking for uh, a, an era of growth and uh, I hope that uh, uh, this will also be an opportunity for the US and Europe to uh, get closer and take full benefit of the fact that uh, as sharing values, we can also uh, share and uh, increase the level of uh, connections on trade, investment, and at the political level to make sure that we have all the benefit of this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you for that, that great overview. I have a, a significant number of questions about uh, a number of the topics you just discussed. I also wanted to highlight for our audience that uh, they too can submit questions. Uh, via Twitter, via email. And if your question is good and interesting enough, I will ask the question. If it is not, well, you know, that that's how it goes. Uh, so let's first go uh, back to a couple of the things you mentioned at, at, the, at the beginning of your comments, which was the, uh, the, the effort to make sure that, that member states of the European Union would not start imposing export controls and, and the like, really to to keep the to preserve the uh, the free movement of of people to the extent possible of goods of, uh, of services, uh, can you talk to us about that a bit? And also, uh, how does that relate to the joint effort to secure vaccines, which I think was really a pretty dramatic new initiative for the European Union? It's received a lot of attention here in the U.S. Uh, I think there were you know there were a few weeks there where it didn't look like it was going that well. Can you? Talk to us about because that was really a new effort. I imagine it required a lot of coordination. Uh, can, can you talk about that experience and how you how you would assess it now looking back? Well, um, one one of the things you have to understand is that uh, ours is an imperfect union. It is not. It does not has the history that uh, the United States of America has, uh, and there are areas of uh, political responsibility which lie within the union 
that is the case of trade policy or uh, a number of other areas, but not uh, or agricultural policy, but others remain in the sphere of member states. One of the examples is precisely healthcare. Healthcare is the preserve of member state sovereignty. And uh, so when uh, dealing with a pandemic of these scales, member states responded the way they knew they, to respond. And finally, we realized that actually it, it, this was hurting the efforts of each one of us to respond to the challenges of the pandemic. So for instance, uh, we could very quickly in Portugal deploy the capacity to produce uh, individual equip protection equipments uh, that we could export to the rest of Europe. Certain uh, medicines, certain drugs we needed from, from other countries or we needed to purchase collectively to increase our purchase power and therefore bargaining power to, to, to others. So I think that it was very, uh, very important that very early in the process, uh, member states could reach an agreement, which was not a European Union decision, actually. It was a collective decision to do, let's do certain things in a coordinated manner. This is not on the sphere of the European Union to decide, but we will coordinate. Uh, and I think one of the uh, reasons that, uh, one of the things that will arise is the need to have a more coordinated approach and probably some responsibilities of the union in respect of healthcare, particularly in a crisis. That was important. The second thing is, uh, as you mentioned, the European Union decided to do something that could otherwise be extremely detrimental to the cohesion of the union. Uh, the European Union decided to do something that they don't do, which is to make a collective purchase of vaccines to deliver to all member states. And agreeing that uh, the, the delivery to member states, so the European Union is buying one acquisition and then it's delivering to member states on the basis of, uh, on a pro rata basis of its population. So you're a richer state, you're a bigger state, you're a smaller state, you're a poorer state, you get the, the vaccines delivered at the same rate as uh, any other state. And that, uh, I think, is also very politically decisive. I, I knew that there was extremely criticism about how late the union was in making the purchases, uh, that they probably didn't do the better job in ensuring that uh, the contrasts were up to speed. They probably lost opportunity to others who had moved faster and uh, began immersed in the extreme controversy about how they liaise with uh, suppliers. But the truth is, that uh, after a few weeks, which were extremely painful, I, and I can tell you politically very, uh, very sensitive, the truth is that we, we, we are now back on speed. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give you the example for Portugal. Uh, uh, at, uh, just now, we have a, a, all the population, which is over 60, uh, uh, has got at least one jab of the vaccine. We have all healthcare providers, all uh, members of security forces and the like already vaccinated. We are now going to into the 50 plus bracket age. Uh, so we, we have practically vaccinated those, those groups which are most at risk of developing serious symptoms or having uh, deaths. So the death rates and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the use of uh, health services are going very, very low. And I can tell you, I'm certain of this, if we hadn't participated in this collective effort, we wouldn't be here right now. Well, that is, that is, that is it's good to hear a strong defense of the, of, the, of the effort. And it's interesting that you would highlight that perhaps health will at least elements of, of healthcare will become uh, more of a of an EU level competi competency than it's than it's been so far. Uh, that is a nice prelude for uh, some of the other uh, more economic policy oriented items. I think that the that the uh, union has used over the past year. You mentioned, of course, the the ECB effort. Monetary policy, of course, has been uh, a uh, an EU wide responsibility for an EU level responsibility for two decades now, but there were a number of other items you, men you mentioned, right? So you, you mentioned the waiving of the uh, budget rules. 
You mentioned the recovery facility, about which I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk later. Um, there was also, of course, uh, union level funding for unemployment insurance in a way that that hadn't really existed before. And I think that's you know that's an area where there have certainly been voices that have pushed for more integration. Where do you see and leaving the the recovery facility aside, where do you for for now? Do you think that there's going to be a push for significant integration uh, in in healthcare, in unemployment insurance, uh, maybe more flexibility in fiscal policy over the next few years? What what what? Uh, where do you think that is headed? Well, uh, if I'm looking from the presidency point of view, which has to be some, somehow neutral in respect of uh, the the, uh, the the different interests uh, aligning in the in the in the European Union, I think. Uh, Progress will be difficult and will be slow. But to be honest, I think that progress will be made. I think that uh, the, uh, you're saying that you're leaving aside the, uh, the, 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 the uh, stimulus plan for the moment. But actually, it is the first time that the European Union is getting some fiscal capacity of significance which I think is critical to making sure that we have a functioning facility. Countries do have differing views about how this should evolve. Countries have differing views about, you know, one of the topics that we are discussing is this, uh, we have decided to do the stimulus plan on uh, the basis that is a, a one-off. It is a one-off. Uh, it is a one-off, uh, but we're saying, and we're raising that on a very long-term basis. And we're trying to make sure that in order to pay for the debt, the union is going to raise resources of its own, such as a tax on plastics, such as, for instance, a tax on uh, digital companies, which I think can only be done in a coherent way if we agree on the OECD, the basis for taxation of multinational companies which I think uh, requires uh, uh, an understanding between the US and the European Union. But if we do this, we're getting to a point where we will have a framework for certain fiscal capacity on the Union. And I think that is important. Uh, I think that we are realizing that for now we have left aside certain areas where the Union will need to invest more. We're talking about border controls, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about some ability to uh, act uh, externally. Uh, but, uh, but I think we will have to come to uh, uh, some agreement. It will take time, it will be difficult. After all, political decisions are taken in the council and the council is composed of national governments and there's 27 of them and certain certain matters need to be resolved by a majority but others require unanimity and uh, so in order to get everyone uh, behind a decision it takes a lot of effort and but I, I i think that the progress that we have made because all countries were so pressed to get decisions done at the, the only level where decisions could have an impact, uh, created some room. We will have difficulties, I'm certain, but, uh, but I think uh, we have shown that some way is possible. I see, so let's then dive into the, the, to the recovery facility, which obviously is a big, uh, as you're saying, really a qualitative step forward in terms of the fiscal capacity of the, of the union. Um, do you think the rollout has gone well? Are you, from the position, from the viewpoint of the presidency, uh, the not all countries have submitted their their plans yet. Uh, you know, in particular countries that aren't that won't be receiving that much in in funding, including my my home country of the Netherlands, where it's you know where it's just less of a big deal, I think, than it is in in Italy. Um, but do you think that that kind of structure is going to endure, as you said? Certainly the financing is going for the long run. So that may, you know, as, as long as those bonds are outstanding on some level, the facility will, will continue to, to exist. Can you, I mean, I, obviously you, you, can't, uh, for, you can't predict the future uh, and neither can I, but if you, if you compare where we are now to where we were last summer, do you think that countries' attitudes have shifted dramatically? Do you think that it, it's generally considered to have been a success so far? 
Where, how, how do you look at that? Uh, well, uh, it were, when we're talking uh, amongst governments uh, in this respect, there's certainly some, and, and if we're talking particularly about citizens and, and companies, there's some frustration that we reached an agreement in the middle of last year, in the summer of last year, and we're getting to uh, the summer of uh, a year later when we still haven't deployed anything. Uh, it, it's it's uh, as you say this can look a frustration but to me to be honest the bulk of the effort in sustaining the economies so far uh, has been undertaken by national governments and all national governments have done unprecedented efforts which was why the easing of the budgetary rules were so important uh, I, I can tell you that whilst Portugal is extremely focused on getting down the level of debt, public debt to GDP, uh, which is very high in this country. We have achieved a very significant reduction of, uh, of more than 20% of GDP in reduction of debt in the past five years. Of course, we almost got back to the same level in just a year. Uh, we are focused on just getting extra, uh, extraordinary measures and that we can get, get back to the level of reduction. We need growth for this. We need growth for this, and uh, we cannot have growth in our country if the whole continent is not growing. And I think that uh, the, what this plan makes is to put the whole European Union on the path of economic growth on a more sustainable basis. It is positive also in ensuring that it is conditional on reforms being undertaken by the various countries in respect of the aspects which the European Union year on year identifies in respect of each member country. And whilst uh, some may think that with making too of much of an effort to support certain countries uh, and others are not, the truth is uh, that the Netherlands certainly do benefit of growth in the European Union. You are an export-oriented country, and uh, uh, more than 60% of your exports go through the European Union. So uh, if we don't have a working European Union, if we don't have a working single market, if we uh, aren't able to make sure that people are buying what you produce in the Netherlands, uh, you will have also an impact. Actually, the Netherlands is one of the most, uh, one of the countries which most benefits from the single market. Uh, so you have a vested interest in making sure that Italy and Spain and France go well too, because you're one of the, the most beneficiary of those. So I think that uh, uh, all countries may not uh, see the same in this respect, but, uh, but I think that the, the, the fact that uh, we've come to a, a, a decision together uh, is for me a good sign. I tend to look at the bright side of life. I think that's reasonable. I think it, I, I personally agree with most of what you just uh, said, in fact. Uh, on the, uh, then on the, on the financing side, you mentioned something that I think is of, of, of quite uh, a deep interest to a lot of our audience, which is the digital services tax uh, and the negotiations at the OECD level. Obviously, that you know, over the past two years, not not a ton of progress appears to have been made for for obvious reasons. But uh, where where do you where do you think those negotiations stand? To what extent do you think individual European member states are going to push forward with a digital service tax beyond what they've what they've done already? Is that an area that has been of interest either from the position of the presidency or, or, or uh, if in your Portuguese role? I think this is critical. Uh, to be honest, Stan, I think that what we're talking about is, is not just you know, taxing for tax purposes uh, and, or for tax sake. What we're actually doing is trying to make sure that we have an international taxation system which is uh, appropriate for this time and age. The basis of the current uh, uh, international taxation system uh, dates a few decades back when uh, the economy and the global economy was based on physical presence and the, the, the trading of physical goods. So we, you, could, you could very well establish that the uh, 
uh, jurisdiction of taxation was that where you know, a company had a physical location or that registered head office. That, that is the basis of our international taxation system. You, you, you declare which country can tax what in its jurisdiction, and uh, that's how you distribute the taxation internationally. This has, has got to be agreed uh, globally, because if you want to have an international flow of capital and goods, you need to make sure that the taxation works. Now, what we know these days is that the economy has changed dramatically. So a lot of the uh, uh, flows have gone, uh, have, uh, have gone to intangible goods and to digital transactions. So what we had in the past decade is that as the economy moved into that cyber sphere, if you want, uh, the taxation system was still looking into the physical roots of an economy which no longer is. So what I think that the effort is being done in, in the OECD is making sure that we update this. We decide where do uh, taxation needs to occur? How do we uh, imp, uh, attribute to each jurisdiction that portion of international profits uh, that should be taxed in, in any given country? And that we agree a, a level playing field, such as a minimum level of taxation, uh, which must be in place so that we don't see this sort of race to the bottom as countries try to attract investment by lowering taxation. We want an open economy and we want an economy where uh, uh, the trade of goods and investment and capital can flow irrespective of artificial barriers such as taking advantage of a, a taxation system which is no longer fit for purpose. Of course, some people... Sorry. I think that uh, we need a common uh, political will across the OECD. I hope that uh, we are probably in a moment where uh, the huge effort that all countries have had to do in order to deal with the impact of the crisis will probably put the minds of leaders in, uh, in trying to reach an agreement and making sure that they can respond to the situation in a manner which, which does not uh, impair the future prosperity and the future uh, state of, uh, of uh, finances. Because we know that where public finances deteriorate, ultimately we all uh, are uh, very badly in a very bad position. And so, you know, what, what people here would say, right? This, you know, uh, the, the entire, the, much of the tech industry is in the US and, you know, this is just a way to, to grab some of those corporate profits. If you think there's activity that is going on in Europe, just, I, you know, you can have yeah, a value added yeah, tax. I, no. don't, I don't think I agree with that. I think that uh, if you if you look at, uh, let, let's look at the traditional uh, US uh, companies. They would have physical presence in different countries. They would be multinational companies with activity in all countries. And uh, where they had a physical location, they would pay tax on the profit which was attributed to that location. That was the past. Now, as the, uh, the, the bulk of the economy is not working physically, what we are seeing is that tech companies are avoiding taxes even in the US because a lot of their international business is not being taxed in the US. It is being taxed on uh, jurisdictions where taxation is very, very low. Ultimately, they can pay nil tax. Uh, and so uh, I think that it's not, I, I really think, and I, I, I want to say this very clearly, it's not trying to uh, tax profits which are generated in the US by US tech companies, it's not at all that. It's just make sure that the business that is being generated in other countries by those companies pay tax uh, where that business and that profit is also being generated. So the US should be able to tax those profits uh, rather than the, having them allocated elsewhere, uh, but also the other countries where uh, the companies uh, make their business and make their profits should have the opportunity to tax this. And I tell you, I'd rather have a common approach at, at the OECD than have a fragmentation of the tax system. Because I can promise you, if we don't get this right at a global level, 
countries will be tempted to start with their own digital tax. And finally, it will be for everyone's uh, damage that we will see that it becomes impossible to conduct international business. As we, that, saw, as we saw in 16, 17 when it started. Exactly, exactly. So, so that's my point. Okay, good. So on a somewhat related question from the audience that I'm going to work in. So the OECD negotiations on, on tax are, are happening. You briefly mentioned uh, engagement with India, where I think, you know, one of the potential goals could be a, a trade agreement. Of course, there was a, a vote on the investment agreement with China. Uh, the EU is working uh, on an agreement with Mercosur, uh, you know, the UK agreement i think certainly the irish side will maybe require some minor changes at some point uh and of course until 2015 16 there was an ongoing negotiation with the us uh on for a trade agreement uh, as well do you think any of those are going to pan out what's the how how it, it, it i understand obviously those things maybe got delayed a little bit during the during the crisis but is that to the extent that it's been the focus of the presidency, are you optimistic about the prospects of any of those deals? Well, let, let, let me put it this way. The European Union success is positive on making sure that borders are open. We are an export-oriented uh, uh, continent. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we thrive if we have open borders, if we have open trade, and if that trade is, is, uh, is uh, made on the basis of rules, which can be recognized and enforced by the country. Uh, this is what made the prosperity of the European Union in the last few decades. So I think that as a union, we have a vested interest in making sure that we open as many markets and that we conduct as many uh, uh, trade agreements as possible, trade and investment agreements, and that we have a working uh, World Trade Organization in place. We know that this was, uh, we know, and I think that we must reflect that this, uh, this era of open borders and open trade policy and multilateral rules may be somehow uh, impacted in the next uh, year. But I think that, that uh, as a presidency, we have pressed for trade uh, uh, negotiations to continue. We have concluded the very important agreements with Canada and Japan. And I think that's very uh, useful for the European firms. Uh, we uh, we know that we have an agreement that concluded with the uh, with China on investment, particularly investment rules, uh, which uh, the intention was to make sure that we have fairer investment rules in place. But uh, to be honest, there's a lot of precedence in closing agreements, such as, for instance, Mercosur. I think that if we want to make sure that uh, that we have the ability to bring in. Uh, countries of Southern Europe into the sphere of uh, open democracies, that should be a priority also for us. And finally, the US. I, 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 I very much uh, was, I, I very much like to see that there was a sort of uh, uh, suspension of uh, uh, heavy tariffs being implemented. I hope this is a precedent for the recognition that um, both sides of the pond uh, need to have the best relations possible. And only together can we, we make sure that we affirm in the uh, global, in a global uh, world, which is uh, changing so quickly, the ability to uh, assert our values and our interests. So I, I, I really do believe that um, uh, we should have a common goal of uh, enhancing and deepening the relations between both sides of the Atlantic. I, I certainly, I certainly hope so. Hope so as well. Um, the the last uh, sort of presidency related uh, question I'd like to ask is about the the European pillar of social rights, the European social pillar. I believe there was a uh, summit in Porto on the on the topic. Uh, for viewers who aren't familiar with this element of the of European Union policy, can you can you explain a bit what it is? How does it relate to the other programs we've we've discussed so far? Uh, well, yes. I mean, uh, uh, from the very beginning, the European Union had some uh, social rights recognized so that 
It's part of, uh, of the rights of every citizen in the European Union, certain, certain social rights, which is probably one of the things that is different between the Europe and the US. Uh, and we had agreed a couple of years ago uh, a, a sort of social charter in, Got in a summit in Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, we had then to make progress on uh, 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 agreeing or certain on certain concrete uh, uh, steps and concrete uh, measures of success and milestones that we commit to achieve. And these summits are very important because once you reach political agreement, then the legislative process can endure to achieve that. And we, we, the presidency uh, has the view that as the world is changing, as the economy is changing, as certain industries such as uh, coal-fired power stations are closing across Europe, as uh, certain jobs are impacted by digital technologies and certain new are created, but certain others are not. As, uh, as we see these changes occurring at a faster pace, uh, and if we are just focusing on making sure that these things happen and that, uh, that business is flowing, um, what we can have is a sort of dissension of uh, citizens and lack of trust in institutions and on the capitalist system uh, at all. So uh, we believe that it was important to make sure that we got back to Gothenburg and achieved concrete steps in respect of that so that people are better equipped to cope with change by either investing in training for uh, workers to make sure that they have the skills required to keep on, new, uh, on, the, on their jobs or move into new jobs, that we, we reduce poverty in Europe because we were seeing that the pace of change was creating a sort of uh, inequality in income and a lot of people being left behind. So we achieved the common purpose on reducing the poverty rates uh, across the continent. And I think, uh, if we, uh, I think if we want to keep a competitive economy, uh, whilst at the same time maintaining the trust of societies in capitalism and democracy, we must look into these aspects uh, very seriously to show that capitalism works for the many and not the few. And, and we should think of the, the social pillar as providing guidance or highlighting yes, that, that it should exactly. be a priority. That's There's no... That's basically, it will be, uh, what we are committing is, uh, for instance, making sure that uh, uh, a certain percentage of workers go to training every year uh, in uh, the, the areas of skills which are identified as critical for their future employability, that we keep track of poverty levels in Europe and we make sure that we address those by either getting people into jobs or otherwise providing some uh, safety network to avoid uh, being uh, falling behind. We, have, we are a very rich continent. We, we can well afford that uh, poverty levels like have kept very low. Well. Excellent. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and and talk about uh, about Portugal uh, and how, how things are going, uh, your experience throughout the, the pandemic. So maybe for people who aren't familiar, can you talk a bit about the, the, the initial public health crisis, uh, the macro environment, and then maybe after that, we can delve a little deeper into areas like support for businesses and, and the like. Uh, that I am particularly okay. interested in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just for people who don't know, we are a, a small country, uh, 10 million inhabitants, uh, GDP per capita around uh, 26, 27, uh, well, in, in dollars, probably 30,000 or something, uh, which we have uh, made a significant change in the last decade. Uh, we had uh, traditionally very serious trade deficits, which created a lot of in -depth, external indebtedness uh, from the uh, beginning of this century, particularly when, when we joined the euro. So the last decade has been a decade of very, very significant reforms uh, where we uh, drastically increased exports. So basically exports uh, came to close to half of GDP, the value of exports, and, we, uh, and the openness of economy is more than 90% in 2019. So basically we oriented 
our economy to external markets and we made a very significant effort to ensure that our uh, external indebtedness was reduced but also the indebtedness of uh, firms and the government uh, so we we entered this crisis probably in a better situation than we had 10 years ago less indebtedness uh, and a more uh, productive uh, economy even so uh, the impact was dramatic. I mean, if you're uh, exporting, if you're, if you have, uh, like we have almost 10% of GDP dependent, for instance, on tourism, and I uh, take advantage of the opportunity to invite you all to come to Portugal, now that borders are getting open again. Uh, this, I, 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 I kid you not, this question is one of the most frequently asked questions during events like this. So Americans are allowed to travel to to Portugal again. I hope. I hope that very soon we will be able to say that uh, non-essential travel, or uh, leisure travel to Portugal from the U.S. is going to be open again. And I can tell you that uh, in the past few days, and just before we had this meeting, I was uh, on a, a video conversation with the president of a very large uh, U.S. airline, who was just sell selling that we just need to say so to, for them to reopen uh, routes. So um, getting back to this, uh, so the, the impact was very huge. And on the second quarter of uh, 2020, GDP fell by 13.5% uh, on, on a quarter by quarter basis and almost 16% in respect of the equal quarter of last year. So we made a, a very significant effort to support firms and support jobs to preserve the capacity to respond. And once we lifted restrictions, uh, and actually the impact of COVID in the first wave in this country was very, very low because we had a very severe lockdown and early lockdown. But once we eased the restrictions and the other markets opened, the economy just rebounded. And we had a second half which surprised everyone. Uh, actually, exports uh, by November uh, last year were above uh, what we had in uh, the equal time in, in, in 2019. Then we were very dramatically hit uh, by the third wave of COVID. Uh, we, uh, the, for those who aren't, uh, the, the, a new variety appeared in the UK, the UK variety, as we call it. Uh, which started in the UK, then went to Ireland, and then came to Portugal in, in, in early December. Uh, we didn't know about that. It's very contagious. Uh, and uh, the, at around January, we were at the worst situation in the world on a proportional rate level. Uh, the, the death rates and the, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the pressure on the health services was extremely severe. We never, we never got to a point of not being able to uh, provide treatment to patients who needed that, but we were very close to that. So again, we went into a very severe lockdown in mid-January, the strictest in Europe. And uh, after uh, three weeks, numbers started to go down very dramatically to the point where in uh, late March, early April, uh, we were already with the lowest incidence uh, in Europe uh, situation we maintain right now. So you may imagine that from an economic point of view, this was like a roller coaster because, <laughs> and we, may, we had to make a very significant effort in making sure that we supported firms and supported jobs so that because uh, we understood that if these were lost and businesses were closed, particularly on industry, this would be dramatic. Now, we have very good results, which I'd like to highlight for you. Uh, trade uh, Exports of goods in the first quarter of this year was ab above what happened in 2019. Oh, well. So our industrial firms behaved extremely well. The, uh, the impact of the very severe lockdown that we have now was mild compared with what we had last year because firms had adapted, you know, online commerce, uh, uh, restaurants uh, providing takeaway food, all this adapted very uh, dramatically. And the, 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 uh, the signals we have 
on uh, the volume of uh, now that we are reopening. From April over, we already have numbers, jobs are being created, actually unemployment st had st stayed very low throughout the, the process. Uh, industrial, the, 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 the volume of uh, business in industry is, uh, is very, very high. Uh, exports again are behaving very well. And, uh, and uh, it's, I mean, it's, uh, uh, as I was saying before, we went live. Uh, the sun is back, restaurants are open, tourists are coming back, and it all looks very brighter now. And so <laughs> that, that is outstanding. Uh, so is, especially during the, the strict lockdowns at the beginning, what kind of support programs did you, did you have? Was this loans? Was it grants? Was it short-time work? What, what kind of, how did, how did, so, how did, well, how, how first, did you make it through with such yes. a relatively undamaged supply side is really, I guess, what I'm asking. Yes, well, on yeah. the on the uh, on the first lockdown, so we're talking about m uh, March last year, what we did is was provide liquidity on a massive scale to firms, so loans guaranteed by government. Uh, we uh, suspended the uh, tax obligations and we passed the moratorium on uh, debt service for uh, firms, which so required. So this was uh, this uh, this protected the, the you know the, the the liquidity of firms and allowed them to continue. We also passed one of the most I, I would say comprehensive uh, furlough schemes in Europe, uh, which which was uh, I'm, I'm not, I now know was very critical to make sure that we preserve the capacity of firms, particularly in industry. If you if jobs are lost in the company, then it's very difficult to get back. So uh, I, I was uh, just uh, the other week uh, with a company which specializes in, in uh, uh, clothes uh, for, for house, you know, how the houseware, mm -hmm. is, you know. And they were telling me uh, that in March last year, uh, their suppliers went, uh, disappeared and uh, the, their markets were closed. And they were just desperate. They didn't know what to do. So when we said, we're going to pay for your workers to stay at home, we're going to provide you liquidity and support and easing your obligations, they, they continued. And what they told me was that uh, eventually they had, in 2020, the best year ever. So they were saying, if those measures hadn't been in place at that point in time and so quickly, we would probably have... Uh, uh, laid off uh, a very significant number of works, and then we couldn't respond when when the markets reopened. So they are selling sheets and and clothes for 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 houses and and towels uh, for the U.S. For instance, which has now become its uh, its strongest market. People are staying at home; they want to have nice homes. So they say bathrobes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here. For the second lockdown. We realized that companies were getting indebted and, uh, and particularly in certain sectors such as tourism and restaurants and the like, that it, we wouldn't be sufficient to, to provide, uh, to provide um, loans. So what we did is we reinstated the furlough schemes and we provided direct grants to companies, particularly SMEs on a scale which was unheard of. Uh, so I can tell you that between January and April, transfers, direct transfers to companies on uh, furlough schemes and direct grants uh, were uh, more than what we paid all the year uh, 2020. Oh, well, so I see. Sales of it. I see. So support peaked in this in this third wave, not, and, not previously. And now Interesting. firms yeah. are responding. Business is, is, is booming again. So we have to we have to uh, stop here in about two minutes. But so one burning question, last question: How are you going to phase out all these loan programs and guaranteed loan programs? Because presumably a lot of that money hasn't been paid back yet. No. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we have been conducting a, so, uh, almost at firm by firm analysis on what their situation is. And I can tell you that on 80% of the firms, they will have no difficulty in meeting their payment plans and whatever their situation, their cash situation is good and their business continued, uh, albeit at, at a reduced level. So we have no concerns for that. We do believe that certain uh, areas, tourism, accommodation, restaurants, uh, some areas of culture and entertainment, some areas of retail, particularly non-food retail, 
uh, are going to have difficulty in meeting up their obligations. So we're working, as other countries have done, in a scheme to allow the refinancing of their past obligations to extend maturities and provide them some grace period uh, immediately so that they can resume business and focusing their cash flows on restoring operations rather than on paying down debt so that we can proceed. And we we're taking advantage of also of the temporary framework which the European Union has uh, uh, granted in respect of state aid to also provide some capital support to, to some companies which may be more strategic and need that support. So Excellent. All, well, just to say, I think we have a path for recovery which is feasible and is sound. We just need the world to get back to business. And, uh, and to, to be honest, these past decade, this country has endured so much and we're stronger now. We're more competitive, we're more productive, we're more export oriented. Then I'm extremely confident that we will do well. And we will do well also because uh, we are within a European Union. Uh, which for which we export 75% of, of what we, we export. And uh, we have also benefit of a decade of a, a ever more closer relation with the United States too. No one can thrive alone in this world. And I think we have very good friends across the globe. Thank you. Outstanding. Well, on that, on that very optimistic uh, note, thank you again for, for joining me. I, this has been a fascinating conversation for me. For those of you interested, head to the embassy's uh, YouTube page for a concert by the Ricardo Toscano Trio. I believe it's jazz music. Um, enjoy and enjoy the rest of your uh, day. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you.